you. So, uh, as a grandparent, I think I'm uh, qualified to say, being a parent is not for sissies. I agree with the comedian Martin Mull, who said, having children is like having a bowling alley installed in your brain. So true. And with all that pounding going on, it's easy to see how parents can lose their grip and start saying really stupid stuff, like, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you like any self-respecting kid believes that. Or if you poke your eyes out with those scissors, don't come looking for me. <laughs> A sister to that, if you cut your legs off with the lawnmower, don't come running to me. Then there's that oft-repeated command, look at me when I'm talking to you, quickly followed by, don't you look at me like that. <laughs> and who among us haven't asked this question? We really don't want an answer to, do you think I'm stupid? <laughs> Parents will often say, why don't you just grow up? All right, Mom, I'll get right on that. Or quit that crying. I mean, how many of you in all of your combined experience ever had a kid stop crying just because you said that? Why, no wonder our kids flinch when we walk in the room. Here's another goodie. Someday you'll thank me. Yeah, but only about seven years in therapy. <laughs> then there's this line my mom must have said a hundred times. Understand, this is back when kids got real money, not Robux. Mom said, Steve, don't put that money in your mouth. And why did she feel so strongly? Because you never know where it's been. Your mom too, right? Now, it's been several decades since I've had the urge uh, to do that, to <laughs> grab a nickel and to pinch it between my cheeks and gum. Seriously, putting money in my mouth is no longer a problem for me. My problem is I try to stick a lot of it in my pocket, in which case you don't have to worry so much about where your money has been. You do have to worry, though, where your money might take you. Few things have the power to destroy a life quite like the misuse and abuse of money. People have gone to jail. Marriages have been ruined. I I've seen kids abandoned, faith in God shredded, all because of money and the stuff money can buy. And yet, there are all kind of seminars on how to make money accounting techniques on how to track your money. You can even learn to invest your money so that your money can make you even more money. But where is the class, the seminar, on how to handle money once you got it? Now, understand, I am not of the mindset that having things is wrong. No, I believe, as Paul also believed, that God has given us everything for our enjoyment, and that everything includes money. Did you know that some of the Bible's most admired heroes were loaded? Job had great wealth. Abraham was, quote, very wealthy. And don't forget King Solomon. His wealth far exceeded even the vastness that it had been reported to be. So don't take this any farther than I'm saying it. There's nothing wrong with having things. It's only thing wrong when things have us. There's nothing inherently evil about money. Just don't put it in your mouth. Don't swallow the prevailing attitude of our day that says, if you got cash, baby, you got it made. But most of all, don't love money. Because if you do love money, whether you have money or not, your love will lead you, Paul said, into all kinds of evil. Okay, I think we're ready to hear from our buddy James. Josh has already established that James is not the kind of guy you want to go golf with. I mean, he's a buzzkill, isn't he? Last few weeks, whew, on most every level. But if you think he's been tough till now... But, but, but baby, you ain't just seen nothing yet. So let's get this over with. James 5. You ready? 
No, I mean seriously. Are you ready? Now listen, you rich people. It gets worse. You ought to weep and wail because of the misery that's coming on you. Your wealth has rotted. Moths have eaten your clothes. Hmm, where have I heard a variation on that line? James, big brother Jesus, right? He used to talk like that. Your gold and silver has corroded, even though William Devane never cops to that on TV. And it will eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who weren't even opposing you. Dude, those verses started bad and got worse. Can you imagine any preacher in our culture starting a message like, listen up, you rich people. However, the crazy thing about these verses, they don't seem to apply to anybody. Have you noticed? Nobody is willing to embrace that you're rich people. I got a letter years ago from a retired banker that's worth in the tens of millions. In his letter, he said, Steve, I'm just an old retired banker living in the desert. (laughs) Yeah. But here's the thing. Even though nobody likes to be called rich, the fact is, if you drove through McDonald's one time this week, if you ate meat this week, If you drove to this service in a car or are watching at home on a flat panel TV, if you own a coat to shield you from the chilly air or air conditioning to keep you cool when the triple digits arrive, if when you go to bed tonight you got food in your belly, I don't care what you say to the contrary, you are rich. When compared to all of recorded history, Measured against every other culture all across this planet. I wish I could take you to some of the places where I have served. In Ukraine, where most people walk several miles under the threat of police engagement just so they can go to church. The home where I stayed there didn't have running water. You were given a bucket to use each day. Their electricity was shut off every day at 6 p.m. In Ecuador and in Haiti, the squalor is beyond words. And although in your mind you're not rich, if I were to teach this passage in any of those places, trust me on this, they'd be thinking of you. And they'd also be thinking of me. Listen, if you have taken a major hit during this pandemic, Or maybe all you're making is minimum wage. Even so, you are still, among all the people on this spinning mud ball, you are rich. So this weeping and wailing James is talking about, that's you. It's it's not they or them. It's, It's you, you and I. We are the ones who have lived on earth in luxury and self-denial, or self-indulgence. We, we can't deny that, can we? So, with that lovely introduction, let's turn to Matthew chapter 19 and watch as James's big brother and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I, I think we need to watch as Jesus interacted with one of the rich in his day. And as you turn... Uh, Please let me give you some context. Matthew 19 again. Evidently, this young man, this rich young man, a rich young man who's been listening in on Jesus' teaching, this rich young man who has the means to buy most anything his heart desires, and yet the thing his heart needs, it's not for sale. 
So he's got this emptiness, this void that is deeply troubling him. And so this, this rich young man's pain that, that Mark describes in his uh, gospel is, is he actually lunges toward Jesus. He fell on his knees before him and he blurted out, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus answered, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know, but that's a topic for another day. However, if you really do want to know what you need to do, as Matthew puts it, if you want to enter life, see it? Obey the commandments. Which ones the kid's re kid required? I mean, he wants to know. What's on the class syllabus, right? What's your grading policy? When are the papers due? So Jesus gives him what he asks for. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. And can't you just feel the tension melting away from this kid like warm butter on hot popcorn? Because this deeply committed, hyper-religious, list-following lover of God, here's Jesus' assignment, and it's like, whoo, I did, I've covered all the bases. What a relief. In fact, he actually says it, teacher, all these I have kept. But then that old familiar anxiety comes washing over him all over again. And do you want to know why? It's because following Jesus involves way more than just keeping a list. It's not a matter of meticulously adhering to the tenets of some outwardly focused dogma. No, following Jesus, is, it's a matter of the heart. And this young man, even though he was very moral, well-intentioned, he sensed, man, something is missing. Matthew says that even though he said, all these I have kept, he still had a question. What do I still lack? I love what Mark says about this moment. He says, Jesus looked at him and what? loved him. Now, what Jesus loved was his passion, even though his passions were a bit misguided. But Jesus' love for this kid drove Jesus to say to him, well, you know, there is one other thing you do lack. Kid probably thought, that ain't bad. All these other commands I've done, one more? Ain't no thing. But Jesus isn't saying, look, you've done 10,000 good things, so if you just do 10,001, baby, you're in. No, what he's saying is, look, there's just one thing you haven't done, and yet it's the only thing that really counts. Because following me isn't about good deeds. It's not about keeping a list. Here's your problem. In spite of all the good that you have done, you are still in control of you. So that on the outside, you appear to be following me, but on the inside, where it really counts, you're still driving your own bus, aren't you? And with that, Jesus touches this young man at the greatest point, or at the point of his greatest weakness. Now, everybody has weakness, right? We can cop to that. And our various weaknesses take copious forms. This guy's flat side, it was money. All that money that he had, that's what was given him fits. And so Jesus gives it to him straight. If you want to be perfect, which that doesn't mean what it sounds like it means, but let's stay on topic, okay? If you want to be perfect, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Now, cool your jets. He's not teaching that some will, what some will tell you he is teaching. 
He's not teaching that philanthropy is God's inside track to heaven. Neither is he saying, if you serve the poor, baby, that's it, you'll be saved. Nothing wrong with doing that. In fact, there's a lot right about doing that. But doing that won't save you. Neither is Jesus suggesting that if you are rich, you can never get saved. If that was the case, we'd all be in a world of hurt, wouldn't we? No, what Jesus is describing is obedience. See, the ultimate challenge for this cat and for you and me is will you obey Jesus no matter what he may ask of you? Will you? Will you do whatever he says, even if it means you parting with all your cash? What's at stake, son, is your very soul. So tell me, are you in or are you out? Now, Jesus isn't being a tough guy. Remember, he loved that kid. But precisely because he did love him, Jesus said, I need to know what's truly driving your heart down deep on the inside. And how does Junior respond? <laughs> you know it. When he heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. And because he did, in fact, um, because Jesus did love him, when he turns to his disciples and tries to reflect on what just happened, he's not angry. He's not irritated. Jesus was sad too. Because this really good young man just couldn't imagine doing life without cash. And so he forfeited eternal life for a bank account that will one day, remember how James describes it? The wealth will what? Right? Moths will eat your clothing. Your gold and silver will rust. And that's why Jesus said, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom. And that word hard, it's an important word in the story because does it mean hard as in it's tough, but you can do it? Or maybe it means hard as in no matter how you try, you'll never do it. Well, Jesus is about to tell us, so we just need to keep reading. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Back in seminary, this young Greek <laughs> scholar penciled these words into the margin of my Greek New Testament, and lo, the disciples leaned back and cackled like hyenas. Okay, it didn't say that. Um, however, I'm convinced that's what happened. So play along for a moment. Jesus is sad. The disciples are disappointed because one of their most promising recruits just walked away. So Jesus, master communicator that he was, felt all that tension and knew he needed to let off some steam, so he made a funny. Seriously, there's no better way to interpret this. Now, I understand most theologians wouldn't know a good joke if it bit them in the behind, right? So they wasted thousands of man hours trying to soften Jesus' response and somehow make this encounter hyper-spiritual. Some will say, for example, that the word camel really ought to read cable. They will teach that the term for a large rope is just one letter different and pr pronounced almost identical to the word used to describe a one-hump camel. So what happened, they will say, is some scribe copied it wrong and everybody's been messed up ever since. But either way, isn't the point the same? Whether you've got a Palestinian shepherd saying, hold on, Clarence, if I can get your tail started, maybe we got a shot at mashing you through this thing. Of course, even if he did mash him through, Clarence would be one strung out camel, am I right? Or... Maybe it's a guy with a huge hauser rope 
going, man, I've been trying to thread this needle for three days, but I'm getting closer. Either way, Jesus' point stands. It is impossible for a rich man to get into heaven. I am possible. Other scholars, equally determined to soften this encounter, said, well, it was a real camel, but it wasn't a real eye of a needle. You've heard this, haven't you? Some writers will take us on a fanciful journey describing this tiny gate, maybe about four feet high, located along the wall of Jerusalem. And the gate was called, they tell us, the needle's eye. And the only way the camel could get through that gate was if it got down on its knees. Ooh, that dog will hunt. Practically preaches itself. You got to kneel down, preacher. Can I have a witness? Not only that, but if there was stuff the camel was packing, hey, you got to take off that stuff, right? Or you'll never get through. So that's point number two. Point one, well, one more point, and, and we got a real fake sermon here, so hang in. Because once the camel is down on its knees and after his possessions have been removed, that's when the camel has to squeeze and wiggle and contort himself so that he can get through. That's what I'm talking about. That is real preaching, baby. In fact, I even put a sermon outline together. Would you like to hear it? Oh, geez, really? <laughs> okay, here it is. Good old time sermon. You got to get down. You got to get rid. You got to get through. That dog will hunt. Just one problem. That little pint-sized half-high gate, there is no historical record stating that such a gate ever existed. None. But even if it did, what logical Hebrew traveler would go to all the trouble of unloading his camel if a full-sized gate was just down the wall 100 feet or so? Besides, when the disciples heard what Jesus said, they were, see Matthew, greatly astonished. And then when Jesus added the eye of the needle part, Mark says they were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? So why do you suppose that's true? Why is it hard for a rich person, and that's all of us, to enter the kingdom well, I could give you 50 reasons, but let me just limit myself to five. First, it's because prosperity undermines childlikeness, the very quality Jesus said we must have if we want to be citizens of his kingdom. You see, rich people, we tend to worry about where, we don't worry about where our next meal's coming from. We worry about what it's going to taste like and the ambiance in which we will enjoy it. Rich folk don't, don't concern ourselves with clothing either. Um, we're more consumed by style and fashion. And, and the rich aren't nearly as concerned that God is worshipped as they are with the style of the service, the arrangement of the um, furnishings and the aesthetics of, of the architecture. You see, money tends to divert our attention from the simple, the basic things of life, to another dimension altogether, a very complicated, a more demanding dimension that robs us of simple, childlike faith, the kind of faith Jesus said is essential or will never enter the kingdom. Another reason it's hard is because prosperity breeds arrogance. See, I'm not terribly worried when somebody in our church is going through a season of suffering. Oh, I, I, I feel your pain, and I weep with those who weep, and I pray for those in need, but what I don't do is worry. And here's why. I've learned that when you're struggling, you've got just one goal, and that is survival. You're just trying to hold on. 
When the bottom drops out, you grab the rope, you tie a knot, and you hang on. You go back to the basics. Maybe you dust your Bible off and start reading again. You hit your knees and start praying again. But when the times are good and you're enjoying a season of prosperity, what happens? You tuck your thumbs under your suspenders and you strut. Am I right? And that's when I worry. Paul, too. That's why he told his young protege, Timothy, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant because that's the natural bent. Here's a third reason it's hard for the rich to enter heaven. It's because prosperity also tends to hold us hostage. And that's why loving money is the root of all evil. See, money may be able to buy you tons of comfort, but money can't buy even one ounce of contentment. Profits, dividends, a bubble in the housing market, etc., etc., just whet our appetites for more of the same. It's like dropping quarters in a slot machine. Even though the bell rings and the whistles scream and a cup full of coins is poured into your lap, it's just not enough, is it? So what do you do? Put the coins right back in because I'm going to hit it big this time. Isn't it ironic? With every purchase we make, we tell ourselves, oh, this is it, baby. (laughs) This will make my life everything it really ought to be. And maybe we're content, I don't know, for a week or until the next iPhone is released. A woman's husband had just told her they didn't have any cushion for any more purchases until next pay period. In fact, as she was heading out the door to go to the mall, you do remember what a mall is, right? Okay. Um, He said to her, now go ahead, you look, but don't buy. Sure enough, she comes back home with a huge bag stuffed. Well, he lit up like a blowtorch and said, I thought I told you not to buy. She said, I know, but I saw this outfit, tried it on, and when I did, the devil said, wow, that really looks good on you. Well, right then you should have told him, get thee behind me, Satan. She said, I did, but when he got behind me, he said, looks good from back here, too. You see, the more you feed on the good life, the more you become owned by the things you think you own. And like a drug, uh, possessions start controlling your hungry heart till you don't even realize it. And all of a sudden, that responsive spirit that you once had with God, it's gone. And just like the rich young ruler, when God makes his appeal to your heart, you you walk away. You're sad about it because you love Jesus, but there's just way too much stuff. It's also difficult for the prosperous to reach eternity because prosperity also creates a false sense of security. I mean, when you got money, who needs God? And yet, bread still molds. Cars still rust. Clothes still fade, bubbles still burst, stock markets still plummet, health still fails. Solomon was right, cast but a glance at riches and they're gone, for they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. That's a refrigerator verse if there ever was one. Haggai I agreed. He said, you earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. You got a purse like that? If you doubt the truth of that, just think of how many people's lives have turned upside down during this pandemic. Or that neighbor, maybe a family member, a prolonged illness has been absolutely devastating financially. Now, imagine you. Even if you were able to withstand an assault like that and and you're still intact, the fact is, folks, I don't care how much you got, one day your body's going to give out on you and you're going to die. And let me tell you something. 
I've done hundreds of funerals over the course of my life, but I have never seen a corpse holding a wallet or a hearse pulling a U-Haul. Because, I mean, why? But you know what I have seen? This is something funeral directors don't want you to see. But when the funeral is over and everybody is quickly ushered out, the pastor stands at the side of the casket and watches as the director takes the rings off and the necklaces and all the other valuables and sticks them in a manila envelope and then hands it off to the next generation. And I have never seen a corpse able to stop them. People, we come into this world empty-handed, and we're going to leave the same way. And that's why Paul says, command those who are rich not to be arrogant, not to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Fifth, those who are rich find it hard to follow Jesus because prosperity tends to make us forget the source of our blessing. Back in Deuteronomy 6, the Israelites are about to enter the promised land. Moses is warning them ahead of time of the dangers they're going to face. Any guess what he mentions first? Listen. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, a land with large, flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of things you did not provide, wells that you did not dig, vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat and you are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you here. And Moses says that because that's what happens. It was the, at the height of David's prosperity when he decided to stay home from making war and committed adultery and murdered that woman's husband. It was only after Solomon had become the richest man on the planet that he began ignoring the laws of God and married hundreds of women, none of whom even pretended to know the Lord his God. And remember King Saul? Man, that guy started right. When he was first anointed to be king, remember how he hid because he didn't think he could be qualified, didn't think he could do the job? But it wasn't that long after the position and the power and the possession started flooding in on him. It wasn't long before King Saul became proud and full of himself and decided he knew better than God. See, that's the real danger that lurks under the covers of prosperity because you tend to forget who it was who prospered you. Back to Matthew. One version says that Jesus' disciples were greatly astonished. I mean, they were flabbergasted because Jesus, the great communicator, got them laughing but then he nailed them with a hard truth that every last one of them needed to hear. And that's when they asked each other, who then can be saved? Jesus answered and said, with man, it's impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Understand, it's not just impossible for the rich man. This is all men and women, religious or irreligious, rich or poor, young or old. Nobody on the merits of human effort alone can ever hope to enter the kingdom of God. It's impossible. It categorically cannot happen. Listen to me. It's not just hard or demanding. It is impossible. Possible. Now, if all Jesus meant to say was, oh, a camel's got to get down on its belly and, and empty its load and then crawl on that belly like a reptile, do you really think Jesus would have said, it's impossible? I'm telling you guys, it can't be done. No, he would have said something like, guys, you got to get down, you got to get rid, you got to get through. He didn't say that. 
It's impossible. All alone, you cannot work your way in. And you will not worm your way through. And not only is your wealth not a help, it's a hindrance. But rich or poor, it really doesn't matter. You cannot do this. You will never on your own merit become my disciple. However, don't you love this part? With God, all things are possible. And that's when Peter, you just knew it had to be Peter, asked the question everybody else was thinking. But Jesus, we've left everything to follow you. We've left our families, our careers. We dropped our nets and burned our boats. We even denied ourselves and took up our crosses. Unlike this rich dude, we've given up everything to follow you. Come follow me. That's what you said. So come follow you. That's what we did. So what's the payoff, Jesus? What then will there be for us? I'm so pleased Jesus didn't gaslight Peter for such a stupid request. And Jesus didn't because in many ways Peter was right. They had followed him. They had served him with a whole heart, nothing withheld. And so Jesus lovingly pulls back the veil of heaven and gives them just the briefest glimpse of eternity. He says, I tell you the truth, that the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man is sitting on his glorious throne, you who have followed me, you're going to sit on each of 12 thrones. Because you guys were the first to follow me. When my kingdom is finally restored, you will. You're going to have a front row seat. My Father is going to restore this old world to its original pristine form. And when that happens, you're going to get a throne. And today, or together, we're going to rule over the kingdom of God forever. But that's not all he said. Jesus then scanned the full span of human history from that moment to this moment. And he said, and everyone... That's you. Everyone, that's me. I'm excluding no one who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my sake. No one, Jesus says, who has released the control of their possessions and who has become poor for the sake of the gospel. No one who has successfully pried loose the stranglehold that having things once held on them No one who has dropped their nets and picked up their cross. No one will fail to receive, get this, a hundred times as much. Do you hear what he's saying? He's saying, you can try, baby, but you will never outgive God. What he's saying is, our ruler king has not and will never be a debtor to anyone. But instead, in his perfect time, he's going to give back to those who have given to him immeasurably more than we ever gave. Now be careful with the math here, because Jesus is. He doesn't say you're going to get 100%. That's just even Stephen You know, you're going to get back what you gave. Okay, big deal. He says, you're going to get a hundred times. You lose a relationship with your brother because you've made a commitment to Jesus. God will give you a hundred other brothers. And you'll get to be with this gang for the rest of eternity. You tamp back your desire for more. And instead of stepping into this beautiful new home, you invest. That's okay. Because in eternity, God is going to deed you a mansion that will far outpace anything you could have ever hoped to have here. If you just take 
10%, just 10% of whatever you earn. And if you'll just give that back to God as he has told us we must do, let him keep it safely. If you'll do that just for now, God promised through the prophet Malachi that he would open the floodgates of blessing all over your life and that he will pour out that blessing to such a degree the Bible says you won't be able to handle it all. The Bible says a generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. On another occasion, he said, give and it will be given to you. Don't you love this? A good measure Press down, shaken together, and running over, it will be poured into your lap. For the, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And that's not just a promise for you in the sweet by and by, as the saints used to sing. That's a promise for you right now. You place Jesus above every other possession you have in this present age. Do you see that? you will not fail to receive a hundred times what you released. It is the undeniable code of God. If you fail to handle your wealth according to his instruction, be prepared. Because what is it that James said, be prepared to do what? To weep and to wail. Because misery is coming. Because your wealth will rot. Your silver and gold will rust. And even more, suffice it to say, it's not a pretty picture if you choose to live this life in luxury and self-indulgence. However, if you pursue the Lord above every other thing, if you release whatever you have into his care, God will. He will pour into your lap so many blessings you can't handle them. And, and if that's not enough for you to get your heart into this, Jesus adds, and in the age to come, not only in this age, but in the age to come, you will have eternal life. You give up something for the kingdom, it's really not a sacrifice. It's an investment. A God-guaranteed investment that's going to pay dividends the likes of which our world has never seen. I could go on, but two words and we're done. In this encounter, we have Jesus and the rich young ruler. He teaches us, first, that to become his disciple, it costs you nothing, but it will demand from you everything you have. You with me? You make a commitment to Jesus Christ, it's absolutely free, right? Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to your cross I cling. It is by grace that we are saved, it is not of works. See, that's where the rich young ruler was so confused. He thought it was his deal, but he was wrong. Salvation is a matter of the heart where an absolute dependence on Jesus, I fling myself upon his grace. But then... Once that transaction has been completed, I've got to be real with you. Your commitment to Jesus is going to cost you everything you have. Salvation is free, but following him comes at a price. God doesn't sell his grace, but there's still a cost. And the rich young ruler is a powerful reminder that everyone who enters the kingdom goes through the same door. And that door is absolute surrender to the point that everything you have it no longer has you. And instead, everything about you belongs to Jesus. Here's the other truth. To walk in the footsteps of Jesus requires that you divest yourself of every earthly dependency and invest instead your possessions, your time, your passions. You invest your life in eternity. Now, it's not 
an actual divestiture, obviously, right? We've got to live, we've got to make life work here. What it is, is it's a surrender of the heart. It is an attitude of your mind, an attitude that understands everything I've been given. It wasn't given for me. It wasn't for my pleasure. God didn't bless you, my friend, so you could have a third car, place in the mountains, whatever, whatever. No, these things have been given to you so that you can demonstrate your obedience as you release them with love back into his care. You see, we're all just stewards. I know you've heard it a thousand times, but you need to hear it again. We are managers. We're just caretakers of all this stuff. And the point both James and his big brother Jesus want you to understand is to walk in the footsteps of Jesus means that you acknowledge deep down in the recesses of your heart that all you have is really not yours. It belongs to another. And that deed is held by Jesus. I love these words from the great missionary David Livingston. Made a testimony of his own life that I have treasured. He said, I will place no value on anything I have except in its relationship to the kingdom of God. Anything I have will be given or kept according as giving or kept according as giving or keeping it. I shall most promote the kingdom of God. I butchered that last line. Let me say it again. Anything I have will be given or kept according as giving or keeping it. I shall most promote the kingdom of God. That's powerful stuff. So I'm going to leave it up on the screen. You might want to take a shot of it. You might want to scribble it down. Make it a prayer of your life. We go through the Lord's Supper. I've asked that it stay up. And I I want you to ask that question of yourself, even as I ask it of myself. Is the way I'm handling my possessions a problem for me? Is it? The problem is, so few others could even know the true answer, only you. Take me, I I can't know that answer for anybody but me. Whether the stuff I currently own or that long list of stuff I'd really like to own, whether that desire means more to me than it should, or whether my insatiable drive for more has given me full hands but an empty heart. I don't know what God wants to say to you today, but I do know this. There's not one thing that you own, not one, from across the full spectrum of your vast kingdom of things. There's not one thing that has brought you the happiness you thought that it would. So that being the case, here's the decision point. You can race out of here quickly and go out and acquire whatever is the next item on your list. Because, you know, maybe this is the one. Maybe this is the ticket. It will satisfy all of my longings. Or you can race out of here determined to seek Jesus. And in following Jesus, you can release everything you have. It's a thing of the heart. It is an attitudinal shift so that the person you have become in Jesus just freely releases everything into his care. I urge you, those are the choices. That's the decision. Do you race out and say, oh, this is all mine. I I need to get this thing. Or will you release all that you have into his care? Please, please, please make the right choice. I plead with you above all other things to seek first Jesus' kingdom and his righteousness. Because if you do that, then all of these things, you know, that you thought was going to satisfy but didn't, 
through Jesus, they will be given to you for your enjoyment forever and ever and ever in full measure. Amen. You have his word on that. Let's pray.